Welcome to Dr. Deep State. So what are we doing here? I believe that understanding biopolitics, a subject most people have never heard of, and specifically an innovation that we're gonna only find here, esoteric biopolitics, will give us insight into what this thing called the deep state is really all about, uh, their ultimate agenda or eschatology, and at the end of the day, a unique and penetrating insight into what's happening in the world today. So let's get going with a little bit of a recap. We were talking about biopolitics and the definition we suggested is simply a study within political science of, or sociology or the social sciences more generally, of power over bodies. And I would say that this thought process is about a hundred years old, maybe a little bit older. So we talked about Michael Foucault and Giorgio Agamben briefly. What I want to do today is go a step back in time to the roots of this idea and how it was tied into the connection of body and destiny through empire. And then I want to go into contemporary thinkers that are thinking about the future and where we're going beyond the control of bodies, but into the Rosetta Stone of controlling the future, which is controlling the code within our bodies. Okay, so I want to keep this sort of basic right now. Um, we want to recap here for a moment about what we're talking about when we say the deep state, in case you haven't followed any of these uh, presentations so far. The deep state, we said, is a, it's a complicated idea, but at its most rudimentary and the most basic, let's start from some of the definitions offered by Peter Dale Scott, which has to do with this idea of a state within a state. And that's quite an old idea, actually. But within the school of political realism, i.e. Carl Schmitt and Hans Morgenthau introduced this idea that, of course, behind the veneer of democracy, there lies a security state in the event that the visible state, for some reason, vanished or was vanquished, a security state would come up. And this comes from Carl Schmitt, the Nazi theorists, and it was used quite extensively in mid-century, especially think of thinking about atomic planning and so forth. So there's this admission that's been on the table that of course there's been a deep state. It's just been on the low down until approximately a year ago when it came out in the popular press and so forth and Tump and the deep state. And I'm here to tell you there's nothing new about the deep state. And the way it's being used is completely misleading and incorrect. The deep state has always existed in the way we talk about it in biopolitics. And that's where we get this idea of Michael Foucault. And I want to go in that direction because I think it's fruitful. Okay. So here are a couple ideas. The deep state, to get it at its most fundamental level, needs to be connected to the idea of oligarchy. And we don't talk about this too much. We definitely, as a, as a professor of political science, it was all but forbidden to talk about it, except in some sort of um, historical sense. In fact, I won't go there, okay? So you've got to get the idea of oligarchy. It's the government that's always existed, but it existed in the modern world in the last 200 years in a new way, as it sort of had a cutout of democracy and it was able to take its age old style of uh, rule and objectives into the modern world through operating behind the democratic framework. So how do oligarchies rule? How does the deep state rule? What is the deep state agenda? We have to look at some long historical patterns here that we've suggested before. One, it's not complicated. People have figured this out century over century. The greatest minds have gone right to it. And it's, of course, usury and controlling the money supply. And if you've ever heard of memes like uh, the people that finance both sides of every war, that's how you do it and move the world forward according to the desired objective. We'll get to the desired objective. I think most of you can probably guess. Um, but of course, most nation states in the modern world don't have extra millions or billions laying around to fight a war. So if they find themselves having to defend themselves, they have to borrow money. 
So every conflict of the same money lenders are uh, profiting, it's uh, in their interest, those money lenders' interest, the bankers, the captains of industry, or as Lenin would say, uh, the people uh, in the ascending heights of the economy. Um, it's in their interest to have a war economy, perpetual war. And of course, behind that, there's this idea that, well, people just love war. But the people that obviously profit from war have an interest in war and in maintaining a society and economics and a culture that surrounds an idea of perpetual war and fear and scarcity that would go along with that. So the people that control the money supply have always been, um, and this was what Plato was getting to in the cave, they're the people um, that are holding the, um, they're the puppeteers in Plato's cave that control the perception. So one, uh, the deep state is oligarchical. It has always controlled through usury and as we suggested, controlling the information. That's what Plato is getting for. He was also privy to these capitalist ideas, but and part of that is controlling the information, controlling the mindset, you control the human being, the body, the mentality, the perceptions. So in order to control that information in our modern um, system, it'd be controlling the education, what you can say and what you cannot, controlling the media, the memes, popular culture and so forth. And of course you get that through monopolies and that's one of the biggest, I think, perceptual errors we have. This idea has been pushed so long that there's a free market and free choice. And I can't push this idea on you if you can't accept that right now too hard. But let me just briefly uh, introduce, and we've done this before, monopoly is the key. If you can monopolize the information, you can monopolize the human being and the body, and the population, biopolitics. Uh, we mentioned before. Uh, Martin Gillens and Benjamin Page, Testing Theories of American Politics, demonstrated a 20-year study, sometimes called the Princeton Study, that all of the policies coming out of this country, and they're pretty much the same in the other democracies, are all by the elite. They don't use the word oligarchy, but that's the idea. All of the policies coming out of Washington, D.C. reflect their interest of the corporate owners. Now, we're kind of sometimes trained to think, well, there's different competing. There's actually not competing organizations in terms of corporations competing for profit shares. That's an illusion. When you go higher up, and William Domhoff noticed this, he begins this article about corporate interlocks with the phrase during the progressive era 100 years ago, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis noticed 100 years ago that when you trace back who's really controlling through interlocking control of the directorates of these companies, there's only a handful of people 100 years ago. It's only gotten more concentrated. So in addition to the Princeton study, I would suggest anybody look at William Domhoff and interlocking directorates. He's done over 20 years of studies on this. And finally, at a global level, nothing will surpass the work of the network of global corporate control. Stephanie Vettela, James Gotterfelder, and Stefano Battenson. The abstract from this, this structure of network has never been done in a longitudinal fashion up to date. It's only been done at the national level. Um, the outcome here, when they look at it, and it, it's pages and pages of minutia of these sort of interlocking connections with algorithms that will you know, make your mind explode. But this has been well peer reviewed now for some seven years and still not refuted. The outcome is what they find is that transnational corporations, what we're talking about Wall Street, we're talking about something that's international. The owners do not necessarily are not beholden to the interest of any nation state. So in the deep state, when we talk about Peter Dale Scott and all the information that follows and corroborates, Wall Street's controlling our security system, controlling our war industry. Well, who are these people? Well, they happen to be located in the island of Manhattan, or at least the corporate headquarters. It's scattered throughout the world. It's international. The interest is not in the interest of the United States or any of the other interest of citizens of any of the other nation states, but for the interest of these corporate masters, these oligarchs. That's what we're saying here with this. In a sense, what they're finding is that the control of this global corporate scheme 
the core can be seen as an economic super entity that's ultimately controlled by far less than 1% of the 1%. It's global oligarchy. And so where am I going with this? Well, it's the sort of conclusion of one huge operation that we can call empire. And instead of thinking about these scattered empires, what we think of is one empire project from Babylon to Assyria, the Greeks, the Romans, the Holy Roman, Spanish, Holland, UK and US, the Anglo-American, it's been one empire. These oligarchical classes have used the same techniques to create this global empire. And it was interesting, you know, the supermodel here, it's, I, I will argue by extension have that we're still in the Roman phase. We're still living in international Roman law and thus forth and part of that project. But the Roman law just usurped all the previous empires. So there's one project at hand with one continuation of oligarch ruling. But what do they want? What is their direction? Well, in addition to usury, controlling the money supply and henceforth controlling the security apparatus and the war economy and the psychology that goes into that over the ages, they do this by shaping perceptions. Of course, that's a monopoly of the information, what can and what, not, what cannot be said. Of course, you can't speak against official narratives or against the war economy, but you can only do so in a managed fashion. Ultimately, I will argue that in part what they do is they remove us, part of controlling our bodies and our minds and our spirits is to abstract us from reality. And this is a whole series of lectures in itself, but abstraction, you're gonna see that they implant for the age old agendas, esoteric agendas build upon this is theories, still unproven, whether or not it's molecular theories or string theories or evolution theories. It's abstraction, your sense from reality, and it helps keep you in the cave. So everything is abstracted. So your own essence, you need to rely on their information, their idea of reality, you know, and it's a great way how the deep state we now find, there's great work on this if you just want to Google it and type into it. The innovation 100 years ago of abstract art was a deep state invention. So people walk into a cave and, you know, which you've heard your whole life. It looks like a monkey or a child or a mentally retarded person created these works. That's part of their abstraction narrative. And it gets deep into the creation of popular music and popular culture and the memes and everything we think about. This is a deep age old project that Plato talks about. They're working from the same playbook. And so they want to control the populations, the bodies, and it, even when we dig into contemporary biopolitics, we're going to take it to that Rosetta Stone that they're really looking for to control. And so finally, I would say they rule through secrecy. And if you can't handle this, you look at every government, and we know that in a democracy, we the people are, this is just, as a professor, this is so frustrating to explain that in a democracy, we create the laws, we create the rulers, yet we realize that government certainly works in secret. Why? It's a war economy and a war culture. So you're going to have secrecy for national defense purposes, and we accept that. But it goes far deeper, and we know that the people in power belong to secret societies. And we've been programmed to kind of <laughs> snicker when we hear that. But really, if this is new information for you, pause for a second. But does that really make any sense. We just accept it. We've been programmed, whether we realize or not, to accept it. Yes, of course, rulers have their secret societies, and that's just what they do. But that's what Foucault calls the secret of empire, okay? And that's the esoteric part of this. It's more than war planning. And so we got this combination of usury, monopolies, uh, abstraction, and secrecy all put together. And so I'm going to go with it. Well, what does biopolitics have to do with all of these things? Um, well, biopolitics speaks of it. Uh, Foucault and Agamben have, and we're going to go back in time to uh, the creation of this concept, the modern empire concept in biopolitics. And we're going to look again into the future concept and direction of biopolitics. And uh, please join me uh, on the other side.